Over four decades, Aberdeen has built deep relationships throughout emerging market economies. And each episode of our Emerging Markets Equity podcast is your chance to eavesdrop on an agenda-setting conversation between me, Nick Robinson, and some of our brightest minds, figuring out the opportunities in key emerging markets. Search for the Emerging Markets Equity podcast from Aberdeen. That's A-B-R-D-N, wherever you get your podcasts. Stocks for beginners. There are so many sports teams in California <laughs> that each one of them is going to have a kiosk of some sort, whether it's you know Penn National Gaming or FanDuel or Flutter or DraftKings or whoever comes in, they will be in every place in the U.S. Hi, and welcome back to Stocks for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatello. I always joke about not having your investing app next to your sports betting app on your phone. But what about investing in sports betting? Hello, Jeffrey. Welcome back to the podcast. Hey, how you doing, Phil? Thanks for having me. Jeffrey Camus is the Principal and Chief Investment Strategist at Inherent Wealth Fund, which runs the IBET ETF. So let's start off by talking about the overall size and shape of the sports betting market. Well, it's it's growing is what's going on, especially in the United States. We've had you know legalization in, in different countries in Europe. Australia's had a lot of it. London's had it for a long time. But you know now we're starting to get, we're at 34 states legalized in the U.S., we're getting a lot of new companies expanding. Most of the companies that are in this marketplace are small to mid-sized companies. Some of the larger ones we know, like Las Vegas Sands, Caesars, those companies. There's also some other ones that like Vici Properties, which essentially owns a lot of the real estate where the casinos reside in Las Vegas. And there's some like that. Melco is another one like that. That's actually, it has a lot of China-based exposure. And that's really interesting right now because We sort of have China coming out of a recession, and now there are some opportunities in China if you have the stomach for it. And we just took, we added a position in Melco just recently. The companies, especially in the the fund now that have China exposure, could actually see a really nice takeoff. And um, these kind of complement a lot of the Chinese stocks. They actually, the sports betting stocks sort of took a, you know, went down at the same time you sort of saw the Chinese stocks go down, which is almost like for a year plus now. So they, they seem to be in a really good spot, and I think they are... They're actually comparing really nicely to the NASDAQ as of late. And I think we're going to start seeing some movement, especially when some of these companies start getting you know, profitable towards the third and fourth quarters because of so much travel. I've been in Las Vegas. I was just there two weeks ago. It was booming. You know, they're, they're packed. And, you know, one thing about this industry, I think that's interesting from an investment standpoint, uh, is that it's somewhat recession proof because people will still bet on sports betting. And we have new opportunities. We're seeing record numbers of sports betting handles in states even in bad months, we're seeing very good numbers. Meaning when I say bad months, I'm just saying there aren't good sports to bet on. <laughs> you know, when you come through, football is really the catalyst. You know, and we're going to get football season starting here again in July. We're going to, you know, training camps open up. August, we're going to get some college football. And then September, the NFL kicks around. And that's really a big catalyst. That's when you see the really, the boom in the marketplace. What about um, horse racing? How have people traditionally bet on horses in the States? You know what? It's, you know, a lot of off-track betting. You can bet in casino. Yeah. You know, there's companies like Churchill Downs. We have, you know, we all have those apps. I mean, I've, I've bet on that app myself because it's kind of, you know, it's entertainment to me, you know, and that's been legal for a long time. It's a small percentage of the marketplace. I think it's, it rates somewhere like fifth or sixth in the U.S., but it, it still does capture a lot. We're, we have exposure through Churchill Downs and a number of other wagering companies that do have OTB or have direct, you know, relationships with track betting. It's always there. You know, in the old days, I think this is really funny. And, you know, if we look at some of the movies we had, like Seabiscuit, mm, mm. you know, Secretariat and those movies in the 20s, the two biggest sports ever in the world were at least the U.S., I should say, were boxing and horse racing. They were the two biggest sports. I mean, college football didn't get bigger till later. And pro football, for forget it, didn't really happen till the 50s or the 60s. Baseball was around, but the two biggest sports were boxing and horse racing, you know, and maybe it's because the storytelling, the way that you could take a day in, there's something about it. Definitely in boxing, you can see that as America went through the depression, you can relate through struggle and strife through maybe the life of a boxer. And I think those are good stories. And those were the big sports back in the day. It's still there, probably fifth or sixth. You know, tennis actually is like fourth in all of sports, you know, gambling. It's very popular to bet on. I'm always surprised at how many people wager. I actually always ask people, do you wager on tennis? And not a lot, maybe in the States. I think there's more maybe overseas who wager on tennis. So what's, what's the range of laws in the States? I mean, for example, which state has the least amount of legal betting? 
Oh, well, <laughs> the least amount would be Utah. It's never going to be legalized in Utah. Yeah. You know, because of the Mormon, you know, the way that they run essentially their, their government there. But uh, overall, if, you know, this could be like a three hour dissertation on legalization because so many different states have all different kind of permutations within their, you know, their law. Cause we're in state law, obviously it's not federal. Mm-hmm. So they're allowed to make different choices. Some have online sports betting, some have in, in kiosk sports betting, some you have to go and verify yourself in the hard location, then you can be online. So there's all kinds of different permutations. We have 34 states legalized. We have about another four that are coming that actually have legalization completed, but they need to get it ramped up. And then we have several really big states still, which is why there's such an interesting opportunity here that are, that are going to be legalized in the next. We, here's a, the really, the big one that's coming up that's going to do the record numbers is California, which is going to be legalized or is on the ballot for November. Mm. That means if they can get it passed in some form, which I believe they will, it'll be legalized sometime, maybe for January, February by the Super Bowl in California. And New York, if you remember, in their first month did a billion in handles. I can imagine California doing two or three billion. The main push against in California is, of course, these Indian reservations, which don't really have a great argument, to be honest. All they argue is that they have some kind of domain. Their, their campaign seems to be very weak, and I don't think it, you know it's going to hold up. They California may give them some kind of room maybe or a barrier like a a brief maybe period where there's some different laws but three maybe a couple years as it transitions in i'm sure that those major players will have the rights to to california as they should and it'll be good for the tax revenue and a lot of the money that they're going to collect tax wise in california is going to go to mental health programs so i think that's you know at least a good cause and we'll see how that gets you know dispersed but that's the that's the what's happening in legalization. We still have two other big states, Florida and Texas, where they're not quite as close. It seems insane as an outsider thinking about California and their liberal marijuana laws, but then the gambling laws are yet to change. Is that the case? <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's sort of not smart, right? I mean, to me, it's they're just letting a lot of tax revenue go to to places it should not. And I think as a Californian, someone who pays taxes here, I believe that. It would be best if the greater amount of people benefits from those tax dollars rather than just having people go to Nevada, you know, to gamble, which is still good. People will still go there. As I always tell people about what's going on in this space, our phones will control this sports betting. That's the reality. On our phones, we will be betting. It's one of the reasons why these businesses are such great investments. Now, it's because they're going to have incredible margins because of the economies of scale and just this simple technology that's on your phone where most of it's going to happen the casinos are going to be the rewards. You know, my son who bets not a lot because he doesn't have the means to bet a lot. He enjoys it, but it's, you know, for fun. He bets in Arizona. He went to school there and he lives in Arizona and it's legal to bet there online. And he bets um, through like MGM's betting service and he gets comps. So it's nice for him. He gets free hotels so he can take his girlfriend to Las Vegas, you know, and he can spend the week. He'll spend a little bit more two days and he'll get free comps. And that's what really is setting up. You're going to have these, a lot of the betting is going to be done on your apps and then you're going to get the rewards by being loyal to the, you know, to that hotel and then you'll get the rewards. And so my, that's happened with my son. He had better comps than me the last time I was there. <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but I got to work that out. I got to call somebody. Yeah. They might like the millennials better. <laughs> right. They, I know, you know, they do. Yeah. You know, yeah. they, well, that's why I like, um, I know we we're going to talk about like the Cosmopolitan Hotel mm. down the road, but that's what that play was. MGM, that was owned by an outside, like a Blackstone, I think it was, a large, a large uh, investment fund group that was owned, the, the Cosmopolitan. But that demographic is great for, for this, kind of, this kind of organization because they're, they're 25. When I've stayed at the Cosmopolitan, it's a great hotel. I'm too old. I feel old there. I'm not too old to go there, but I feel, you know, it's skewed to young entrepreneurial 25, maybe if, you're, if you can make it there, 30 to like four, mid 40s. You know, once you get over 50, you're a little bit too old for there. It's a nice, you know, I feel more comfortable with maybe an Aria or something like that. But <laughs> it's a great hotel. And that was a big reason why MGM wanted to get that property. And that's why Penn National wanted it, because it's a great demographic. And it's, they wanted some access on the Strip, too. And that's a, that's a premier location. You know, it's a great central location. In between all those MGM hotels, they had to lock it down. Over four decades, Aberdeen has built deep relationships throughout emerging market economies. And each episode of our Emerging Markets Equity podcast is your chance to eavesdrop on an agenda-setting conversation between me, Nick Robinson, and some of our brightest minds, figuring out the opportunities in key emerging markets. 
Search for the Emerging Markets Equity Podcast from Aberdeen. That's A B R D N. Wherever you get your podcasts. I guess this is part of the demographic evolution. I mean, it brings to mind one of my favourite movies, Casino, of course. And um, do you remember the? Do you know the movie Casino? Robert okay, De Niro. Come on. I, of you course, know, I, yeah, do, yeah. I do a show with um, mm. a friend of mine. His his name on the show because a lot of these wagerers or the professional gamblers have have names, but his name is Uncle B on the show. Yep. And Uncle B actually was a bartender in a bar in Del Mar where the Lefty Rosenthal character was hanging out because he used to hang out at the Del Mar racetrack. Mm. So he comes on and he tells me actual stories about what uh, Lefty Rosenthal would bet on. And he wouldn't bet on everything. Mm. He would only bet on things he really knew about. Yep. You know, a lot of us do it. He was doing it as a business, not just to have fun. So if he yep. knew something and he loved to bet college football because he would always find out about either a girlfriend problem or somebody who had an alcohol problem, mm. you know, cause this is the fifties and sixties. It wasn't so much about drugs back then as it was about alcohol. And it's always about a girl. You know, <laughs> if you look up, if, if there are ever a baseball player or a football player at slumping, I'm always first thing, you know, something with his girlfriend you know, or something at home, <laughs> you know, with his wife. But, but yeah, I love that movie. Tell me what you were going to say. With you, no, I was just going to ask about the evolution because um, right at the end of the movie where it shows the end of the old Vegas, the Rat Pack, Sinatra kind of Vegas, and they've got that slow motion shot where they're opening up the brand new casinos and it's all overweight people in leisure wear coming in with absolutely no class and culture. <laughs> not quite as a sexy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Not quite as sexy as you imagine. Well, it, he, I think he was kind of just connoting the idea that they had opened it up. I think Vegas made a mistake in those years. I think in the 80s and 90s, they were mm. going for family oriented. That is not the mm. feel in Vegas now. Vegas is, is very much adult, young entrepreneur, you know, 21 and wherever. There's still some activities, but that is not the theme in Vegas. The theme in Vegas is for 21 and up and, and get those people there. I think there's some of that. And I do, I did have that feeling, but there's not as much of the things for the kids. There's always distractions, but you know, you don't see, like I was at different, I go to different pools and you always check out the pools to see how many kids, you don't see a lot of kids there. It's mostly Mm. young adults. So what are the challenges facing the industry? Well, it's, here's, here's why like an ETF, like I bet is great for an investor. The challenges obviously are it's growing fast. You know, we always hear this analogy on CNBC or any of the stock programs that people listen to and they always talk about what inning. They'll say, what inning of the of the bear market are we in? I guess we're in inning, like hopefully we're in inning nine of the bear market, but they would always say, what inning are we in the bull market? And in the sports betting area, we're like in inning zero. It's still so new, especially in the US. You know, we're we're talking about legalization only three years, that these companies have yet to really you know, get their sticking grounds. You know, when you talk to someone, I talk to companies that deal with a lot of the European companies and, and I talk to anybody who's in my ETF when I can get them and talk to them, the European companies are set, you know, they have their customer acquisition strategies set up, they have their partnerships, they have all their strategic partnerships and they know how they're gaining customers, right? Here, this is the wild west in the U S because they are fighting tooth and nail for clients. And the big challenge that we heard about a year and a half ago was that they have ridiculously high customer acquisition costs because they're doing anything to get the client to come in. What I'm seeing as the trend, and as I talk to more of these companies now, is we're seeing much more strategic partnerships, which is really the way that Europe does it, whether it's with affiliates, people people who will create sites and you'll have partnerships with them and you'll bring them in on the, you know, the reward. You know, if they send you a client, you'll, you'll take care of them or it's strategic partnerships like, you know, DraftKings opening up a beautiful lounge at Wrigley Field where they can go in there and they can have a destination kind of kiosk or a place where they can wager and then they can use their services. And those are the really smart things. And I'll tell you, you will see in every state, I guarantee you that there is pen and paper on every major league franchise in California right now waiting for the approval because there's so many sports teams in California <laughs> that each one of them is going to have a kiosk of some sort, whether it's you know Penn National Gaming or FanDuel or Flutter or DraftKings or whoever comes in. They will be in every place in the U.S. And those are the new strategic concepts. Rather than just spending, I think DraftKings spent a lot of money, unfortunately, you know, when they first went public, you know, through their SPAC. And they raised a lot of money. And I think they spent a lot of it on wide, wide range advertising. You know, my brother who thinks that sports is the ballet was asking me who DraftKings is. And I was like, yeah, no, why do you know about it? You know, and because he doesn't, you know, he's not somebody who would sports wager and is not really a huge sports fan in any way. And I think if they're reaching them, they probably were overshooting. 
And I think now they've learned. They are doing things with inducements now. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of things with these kind of teaser bets where, you know, during the March Madness, they had, uh, there was a game where Gonzaga, a U.S. basketball college team here, was given like an even money bet, meaning it would just be a win-loss bet for $50 just to get you in the door. Well, that was easy money. It really was. That was the easiest money. Now, you could only bet it to $50, but if you bet it, you won. And you walked, and that would be, you know, I told people, get on that bet. That's a great bet. They were favored by like 20 points. But that's a smart thing they can do to get you in the door. What they were doing too much a little bit in New York is they were, MGM and some of these companies were giving large, large opening bonuses, like up to $3,000 I saw. And I think that they're learning from that. And I don't think we're going to see that when California opens. I think they're starting to get a little bit more wise about, you know, what the marketplace is, you know, you know, will it will be good for their numbers as they grow their businesses. Because I think the investors are are wanting to see these better returns. And I think we're seeing a lot of money going into advertising too much. What does the entry of Disney into sports betting say about this sector? Well, I think it's it shows how I think that it's normal. You know, this onus of it being a dark alley thing is not the case. You know, it's very corporate. Like the moving casino, what they were really talking about there is that at the end of the movie is that it became a corporate thing. It wasn't going to be a bunch of guys who could put together a hundred million and put a casino together. You know, maybe unless you're Steve Wynn, who was genius, you could do that. But you know, they, he had partners too. You know, but but the point is, is it's corporate. You know, these companies will will either be publicly traded or they will go public at some point. And it's you know, the ecosystem in sports betting and gambling is just like the ecosystem in technology. You have all the same companies, cloud companies, technology companies, analytics companies. They're all doing the same thing, but for this specific niche, it is a major, major industry. You know, billions and billions of dollars of industry. It, most of the companies are small and mid cap. You know, in Europe, we have some larger ones too. Most of them are small and mid cap, um, but it is a growing industry. And as we get to eventually, I think we're going to get to 49 states legalized in the next couple of years. We might not, we may never get Utah, but we're going to get them all there because it makes sense tax wise and people want it. Okay, so you're running the iBet ETF. Tell us about the ETF and some of the more interesting holdings in this fund. Right. So the ETF really gives someone an opportunity to invest in a growing segment with a cager of about 12 to 14% over the next four years. So it, it's got a lot of growth in it. It's got a lot of things that's happening. It is more recession proof than I would say a lot of things. If you look at some of the companies that are in the fund, I think there's a lot of companies. You have a company like Boyd's who owns like the Fremont Street Casino. Their numbers are actually holding up quite well. If you look at it compared to like the S&P 500, it's holding up quite well to the S&P 500. Their, their numbers are good. And there's a lot of companies in this industry that actually have really good price to earnings ratios. You know, things where you think that these are all uh, growth companies, they're not very few. In fact, if you look at the fund, a lot of them are making money. Most of them are making money because the margins in these businesses are very good. Uh, you, when you talk about online, you have a potential to make incredible like 70, 80% margins just on the online area. A company that I like is Bally's is interesting to me. I grew up in Chicago. Bally's is working towards putting together a casino on the waterfront, Lake Michigan and Chicago with views of the lake, fire pits up on the roof. One of the greatest convention cities in the United States. I think that's a really exciting project. I do like Disney. Disney's not in our fund right now. They were earlier in the year. They're not in the fund right now. I think they're really interesting. I like Penn National Gaming because I think that the stock is undervalued. I think a lot of what happened with some of these stocks was that we kind of had that bad taste in our mouth from DraftKings because they were spending a lot of money on customer acquisition. And a lot of the stocks in certain sectors, they end up trading similar, even if they don't have similar numbers. They just get this kind of onus where a lot of people were starting to short. In fact, this was a popular short for the last year. And you would have seen a lot of people do well, but people got on this DraftKings short and they started shorting some of the other companies as well. And I think something like Penn National Gaming, which has the Barstool Sports kind of tie-in, I think is a very interesting company. I think their marketing is much different than what DraftKings has done. I think their number, they are way, it's way undervalued where it sits now. That's a really interesting company. You know, a lot of the European companies are, are, are great. We have you know Flutter, which actually owns FanDuel, which I think is a really interesting company. And then other companies that we maybe don't have in the ETF right now, somebody like a Sports Radar which is an analytics company. You know, when you see a lot of like the online live betting that's going on, live betting now is a kind of a new innovation. That means that in during the event, you may have different odds. Now, I would tell you as someone who likes to wager myself, I do not think that that is in your favor. I think the best chance you have as a wagerer is to get the game right at the beginning 
because I think the house will have way better odds and analytics on the numbers during the game because they will be able to throw probabilities. What we know is we don't know how a team's going to show up, <laughs> you know, but during the game, once they start seeing how they're going to show up, they have enough data to see what's going to happen. And I would tell, I told people on my show about a funny, but I made this year, which is kind of interesting. Something new that's in wagering now and online is that I think this was through the DraftKings app. My son made the bet. And uh, we had bet the Bulls, Chicago Bulls basketball game against Milwaukee Bucks. And the Bulls were getting 18 points. Milwaukee was heavily favored. Bulls made had a great game. I think they were up with the points by like 28 or 30 at halftime, where the the operator offered a buyout of the bet at like a 95, 90%. And so, of course, why wouldn't you take the buyout at that point? So that's something new that you never would see in the old days. Like you couldn't call your bookie and say, hey, will you give me a buyout? I'm up by three touchdowns. But those are some of the new things. But Sports Radar is a company that actually has, they're sort of like a platform builder. It's really interesting. They have all this analytics they do, but then they have a full platform. So if you're a new gaming company or you're looking for a new platform, you can come to them and they will essentially assist you with having all the database and all the platform set up to just throw on top of your layer and have a whole gambling system. So there's a lot of, it's sort of just like, that's like a sales force maybe for, for betting, you know, and and there's all these huge companies in in the ecosystem. So it's a lot of interesting, different companies all supporting, right? Even have a company like every, it's kind of boring. Um, They do, they do ATMs and machines, you know, scientific games and machines, but they're innovators too. And a lot of those businesses are better because they actually know right now there's a real backup actually in getting machines, just like everything. It's a supply chain issue because no one has chips. I would just say what's super interesting about this is any industry that you understand, like if you understand technology, the same ecosystem exists in sports betting. It's, it's, it's about a technical revolution because they are efficient. This is not about mm. going to Las Vegas. You know, these stocks get traded poorly all the time because they're like, oh, if no one's going to be able to go, I'm like, that is not what ha- what's happening. The destinations are good, but they're not where all the money is being generated. The money's being generated online. It's being generated on your phones. <laughs> so, so that's what's happening. You know, these major handles and the, the resorts and destinations are great. And I had a great time in Vegas when I was there. It was very crowded, lots of people. And I'm, I'm happy to see it. And I talked to a lot of people. I learned a lot more about some other companies that I've been researching. Well, I was just going to ask, presumably this is actively managed, this fund. Yes. That's right. Yep. So what is the kind of criteria? What's your, um, the benchmarks that you're looking for in companies to include in the fund? I use a lot of technicals. I want I'm looking for something. So what I think is interesting is the reason I added Melco is because that's very, and I've actually bolstered a couple of the positions with China exposures. It makes me, I watch something like the K web, which is a Chinese stock ETF that's kind of rolled over so much that it's started to make some gains. And you see that in the tenor where Uh, the Chinese economy now is going to be more conducive or they are going to be essentially, they're going to support their economy more, you know, with not raising interest rates and doing more things to build their economy because they are coming out of a recession. I think what you're going to see here in the U S by the way, not to go and jump around too much, but that we're going to end up cutting interest rates again by probably a half a percentage point, probably next year at some point, maybe this time next year, we're going to be talking about cutting interest rates because that's what always happened. It's starting, it's starting to feel that way, isn't it? The bond market tells us. Because the bond market is like, we wanted to get ahead because you were wrong. The bond market was slapping, that's not be disrespectful, but essentially the bond market was slapping, you know, Powell in the butt saying, hey, you're late. Mm. We're going to get way ahead of you because that's what the tenure did. And now it's kind of saying, okay, well, we're seeing things kind of change really fast, which I think is amazing how fast it is. And I believe everything's tethered so tightly that that's happening that way. And then we're seeing something like China. The active does for me is it lets me change things. I believe what we're, we're performing as a, in general, the fund is performing better than one of our primary competitors. And I know it's because we are active. Mm. They are not, they're indexed. And it allows us to change things when I see an opportunity for the fund to do better. And so getting into China now in some positions in China with more exposure, like Las Vegas Sands, Melco, there's a couple others that we're looking at is what we want to do because we see that the bottom is in, I think, in China. And I think that if the government's going to be opening borders, which we're hopeful of, we're going to start getting more tourism there and we're going to see Macau numbers go up. China's a little bit of a, you know, it's, it, it's the, you have to have a strong stomach for it. But I think that there's some opportunities there. So that's what we're allowed to do being active. I also watch technicals a lot, you know, looking for technical bottoms, technical tops, some of those things. And, and fundamentals, when I hear interesting stories about casinos expanding territories or opening or who's going to open an area. You know, those are things we're looking for. And so we can get ahead of the other funds. And I know that if you look at our returns for like the last three months, 
I know we're six percent better. We've been generally better, and I can't really give those numbers, but I, I know we've been better than our than one of our main competitors in the U.S. And it's because we're active, because we're able to update. We're not going to wait till the quarterly. You know, you have to quarterly re, you know, boot everything. We do it when we see the opportunity. So MGM recently purchased the Cosmopolitan Hotel in Vegas. And Penn National Gaming was also in on running the strategy behind the purchase. Tell us a bit more about this. Well, I think that, you know, Penn was a little upset that, that MGM got that because uh, Penn wanted it for the exposure to, to Las Vegas Strip, giving them another ground location. And MGM wanted it because they wanted to lock up that territory because they essentially have that whole boardwalk area, which is locked with casinos from MGM from one to the other. And I always stay at MGM. I get comp there. I love the hotels there. I think I think they they do a great job. I think the rewards program is great. You know, uh, the M Life program is excellent, and I think they just wanted to lock up that territory. I know that uh, Dave Portner was upset because of you know his relationship, the barstool relationship with uh, Penn, because he said that it was not fair, and he believed that there was some insider. But you know, you know, I'm not sure how that started. You know, essentially, Vici Properties is the company that owns the real estate there. And MGM is like one of the biggest, you know, tenants for that company, right? Essentially. And that's a REIT. Actually, it's in our fund and it actually has a nice dividend because REITs, you know, have to pay out 90%. Company does very well. It's one of the largest cap stocks actually in the sports gaming industry, though they're not directly related to sports wagering or, or betting. They are the, the landlord of all these companies, right? So it's sort of, that's what they do. And so I think that, you know, there probably was some incentive to get MGM in there, to be honest. And I think it's a great hotel for demographics for them as they continue to build uh, online gaming, because online gaming is going to be dominated by people who are 25 do, you know, my kids who are 21 and 22 who don't wager a lot, but they enjoy it and they have apps and they're those, that's the phone generation. I, my kids don't even watch TV. They're on their phones. <laughs> Everything's on the phones. I was, you know, they've been spending more time with me. I live down in the desert now and that's closer to where they live. So they spend more time with me and all they're doing is. They don't watch TV. The TV can be on in the room, but they're on their phones all day, you know, and that's where the gaming app companies want them. (laughs) One of the great themes at the moment in investing is, of course, ESG. And what are your thoughts on the ESG-ness of sports betting? (laughs) You're going to really ask me about this? I'm really going to ask you. (laughs) Um, So I'm not a big fan of it because I think it's a stamp. And I think that people set up companies right now where I'm not sure that they can claim that they can investigate. I think in some of these really large companies, I'm not saying that people don't do it. I'm just saying it's a big statement to make um, for an opportunity. And I, and I am not a big fan of it. It's not an angle that I really pursue in sports gambling. Um, I would say that I know that this is a hot topic and there's a lot of funds that, that surround themselves in the stocks. To me, if you're going to do an ESG uh, program on some of these huge companies that are billion dollar companies, how in depth would that have to be? I would think that that would be, it would take you two or three years to put a study together to see if they were really ESG, you know, if they were evolved enough to be ESG certified. And so I think it's, there's somewhat of a disingenuous feel to it. I, you know, I know it's a hot topic. Um, and I think that anything we do to be more, to have that kind of governance and have that understanding is better. But I think that I'm, I'm just wondering how detailed those programs are to get affirmed or confirmed in those programs. Mm. Oh, just as an example, I know here in Australia, uh, I'm involved with the Australian Shareholders Association who are very concerned about ESG. And one of the ESG ticks, I guess, was that Crown Casinos treated their employees very well during the COVID lockdowns because obviously everything shut down and they continued to pay their employees quite for quite extended periods of time. So, you know, in terms of the governance side of things, they can do okay. Well, you know what, um, Crown Resorts, thanks for bringing that one up. They, they're actually in my ETF. Mm. That's actually been, I know, that, I know. <laughs> that's been a, that's been a standout stock. Mm. I will tell you, that's been one of the best stocks when we added it. It's up, it's up, I think it's, 20 or 30% since we've added to our fund. It was originally in the fund day one. It has been an outperformer. And if you put that up against any other stock, any other stocks in the ETF of the fund, or you could pick 60 or 70 in the space, I bet it's one of the main outperformers. Because mm. uh, it seems strange hearing all this from Australia because the, the gaming industry in Australia seems so mature in comparison. It is, absolutely. And a lot of it is government run as well. Yeah. Well, like, are you talking about like more of the lottery company? The lottery companies. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. I think there was, to me, that was, that's an interesting one. We have actually have a big position in both the tab corp and the lottery corporation. Mm. That's an interesting stock. I really want to know what's going to happen more with that. I'm, I'm watching it closely. You know, they spun off or they demerged the companies, 
you know, we had Tab Corp stayed as the gaming, and then we sp- they split it in the Lottery Corporation. Lottery Corp is a huge business that there's much belief that it was separated for a potential buyout by a large conglomerate, a big broker house, just, you know, uh, an investment banker type company, because it's such a gigantic, you know, it's, it's, just, it's the cash payer. Mm. And the other business is still going to have to be built. It's going to go through the, you know, but we were, I was interested in it. And we actually upped our position knowing that they were going to have the demerger because I think it's, there's a lot of interesting opportunities there. It'll be, I'm, I've been watching it. That's all I can say. I don't know if you heard more about what's going on with it. No, I, I should um, just check it out because I know that the Shareholders Association here in Australia does monitor several of those companies. And um, I'll, I'll do a bit of a dig and see if I can find out any more information for you. Yeah. And then we could talk about it a little more. I, I, get, I just get yeah. what we get on the news wire, what's available that mm-hmm. I can pick up. But I think it was really interesting. We also have some exposure to Star Entertainment mm-hmm. Group. Mm-hmm. And so we do have some Australian exposure. And again, you're right, because there has been these companies have been around for a lot longer than a lot of the U.S. companies, which are all kind of infants compared to the Australian companies. But that that one crown for sure has been a, one of our performers in the fund. So how can listeners find out more about uh, the IBIT ETF? Well, they can either look me up, Jeffrey Kamis, K-A-M-Y-S. Uh, they can Google the fund, which is Inherent Wealth Fund, or they can just Google IBET ETF, I-B-E-T, uh, sports betting and gaming ETF. Fantastic. Jeffrey Kamis, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Phil. If you found this podcast helpful, please tell a friend, especially if it's someone who needs to start thinking about investing for their future. You'll be helping them and helping me to keep this show on the road. Stocks for Beginners is for information and educational purposes only. It isn't financial advice and you shouldn't buy or sell any investments based on what you've heard here. Any opinion or commentary is the view of the speaker only, not Stocks for Beginners. This podcast doesn't replace professional advice regarding your personal financial needs, circumstances or current situation. And thank you for listening to my podcast. Over four decades, Aberdeen has built deep relationships throughout emerging market economies. And each episode of our Emerging Markets Equity podcast is your chance to eavesdrop on an agenda-setting conversation between me, Nick Robinson, and some of our brightest minds, figuring out the opportunities in key emerging markets. Search for the Emerging Markets Equity podcast from Aberdeen. That's A-B-R-D-N, wherever you get your podcasts.